It's my very great honor and privilege tonight to introduce to you Bill Trimbley. Professor Trimbley is the author of six books of poetry, including his most recent, Rainstorm Over the Alphabet, and Duhamel, Ideas of Order in Little Canada, a finalist for the National Poetry Series, series competition, as well as a novel, The June Rise. His creative work has earned him a pushcart prize, a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, and publication in many anthologies and journals, including the Massachusetts Review, Indiana Review, and the Ohio Review. Well published and well known, not only as a poet and novelist, but also as an astute critic of contemporary American poetry, dozens of his reviews have appeared in Western American Literature, Colorado Review, and American Book Review. A professor of English at Colorado State University, for 30 years, Bill Trembley has also been a dedicated and passionate teacher of writing. The list of his students' many success stories, including Yusef Komanyaka, a recent winner of the Pulitzer Prize, is stunning. But to those who've had the opportunity to study with Bill, not surprising. I was lucky enough to have Bill Trembley as my teacher and advisor for six years during the course of two degrees. And I saw firsthand how he guides writers to their best work. The creative writing workshops he taught were intense, productive, and inspiring. And outside of class, he always made time for students who so often sought him out to discuss their work. Looking back, I now understand what a sacrifice of precious time he was making in order to talk to us sometimes literally for hours at a time. The dedication that Bill extends to students is matched only by his dedication to his art. The syncopated music of his work weaves the passion and virtuosity of jazz with the urgency of prayer. Like the street lamp one poem describes, each poem is a made thing of glass and incandescing wire, part beauty, part jolt, part divine telegraphy, part web of scars. Mystery rescued from mystification, his is an art of character and story and landscape, an urban one of mills and factories and blind alleys, as well as the rural one of the Colorado foothills. Generously humane, what these poems do most and best is examine the human condition from the inside out with empathy and with curiosity, realizing, as does his character Duhamel, that something is missing is what you start with. These people who all wanted something better, something real, who are lost, bricked in, melting, begging for another chance, looking up at a narrow strip of stars in the shape of a big capital I, find voice here. With these poems, Bill Trembley makes an opening in the sleepless dark, which fills with new connotations spoken when we stagger, struck by the beautiful blunt instrument of the world. Struck by the beautiful blunt instrument of this poetry, what we learn is to hear the difficult music of other lives and of our own. Please welcome Bill Trembley. When Sandra was driving me up from the airport in Atlanta, we had a chance to talk last night and today. She was talking about recent American poetry, uh, contemporary American poetry, um, and she, she put a label on a certain kind of writing, which uh, I thought was pretty smart, which is uh, a term, post-confessional lyricism. And I thought to myself, I think that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and then 
at breakfast, um, Sandra said, well, I think that's about what 75% of the American poets are trying to do. So uh, I, I'm in a pretty crowded field, but let's see if I can do something with it. Um, I'm going to start by reading a passage from my novel, um, which is uh, entitled The June Rise. And the name comes from the local expression in the Fort Collins, Colorado area where um, I've been living for 30 years. Um, that is to say that every spring comes the snow melt and the rivers get swollen. And so that's the June rise. And um, I'm going to read you a passage about rivers. It's a kind of coming of age novel, uh, at least in part. Um, the hero is an actual man, historical figure by the name of Antoine Janice from St. Charles, Missouri. And in 1840, his father, who was a, a sort of first generation mountain man, uh, takes him out and tries to teach him the skills and knowledge that goes into being a mountain man and making a living on uh, the beaver trade before silk hats came in and suddenly beaver hats were passe. Uh, I got interested in this novel, or rather in this man, because his house uh, has been reconstructed by the daughters of the American Revolution just outside the museum in Fort Collins. And I, I started finding out about him. At first I thought it was an adventure story and a kind of coming of age story. And then uh, I learned more and more and more as I did more and more research. And uh, what I discovered was that in 1877, he received an ultimatum from the United States government in which um, he was told that he could either have his 160 acres of land in Colorado from the Homestead Act, or he could have his Ogallala wife, but he couldn't have both. And he gave up the land for her. really extraordinary. So I thought that I'd just read a passage. His father tells him the story about uh, a man called the underwater man who's a Cheyenne hero, uh, a man who uh, gives up his life so that the uh, tribe can live, can find more buffalo. And so he, the young 16-year-old uh, Antoine says, what kind of story is that? Are you telling me I have to give my life up? And his father says, it's what the Lakota people would call Hanbloglaka, a story that tells of spirits and great deeds which give heart to the people. It's not that you must give your life up, but sometimes you have to let yourself be taken into things huger than you, things that hum with the power of all life with what the Lakotas call Wakan. To feel those huge powers take you away as if you was a little boat carried off in their bloodstream from time to time is what I come to believe life is about. And it has nothing to do with practical things like if we survive. We don't survive those meetings with these forces. Something changes inside us, and we ain't the same thereafter. Like as if you was to 
try crossing a river. The Arkansas, say, up in those mountains where it takes its source and it's a June rise. You have maybe a strong horse, but the current's so wild, the river's suddenly so deep, the horse steps off, plunges, and you're ripped out of stirrup and saddle, swept downstream toward white water and killer rocks. Imagine I'm riding on the riverbank trying to get rope on you at just the moment you hit a sinkhole. You're trying to swim yourself free. Stroking hard, hard, but you're tiring, you can't swim. It's too powerful. And I'm shouting over to you over the water's roar. You have to let yourself go down. When that happens, you will feel small and alone. But then the spin of that sinkhole water will take your body as if it were lighter than some lucifer stick, tumble and spin you out a ways downstream. And only then will you know you've been given your life that day. And I read this passage and I realize that one of the things that I was writing about was writing. That a writer has to let themselves be taken by things huger than themselves and even taken down. Uh, but they have to trust that. They have to trust the way in which nature will work and get them out. The more you panic, the worse it gets, in other words, about writing. Okay. I think it's always about writing. I mean, you don't always understand it the first time around. Okay. And in fact, a lot of what I write, I, I don't fully understand. And it takes, it takes a while. And sometimes what happens is that somebody from a really you know, attentive audience will come up to me afterwards and give me an idea, and I'll just slap my forehead and say, why didn't I see that? You know what I mean? That is to say, understanding something about uh, what was going on in a poem or, or a story of mine that I didn't even know, you know, but it's a great revelation, believe me, and a, and a great joy. So in the early 90s, I was writing for four years on this novel. And it was a strange kind of thing. I'd do research. And then about three months would go by. And then I would start writing. Because the thing that happened was that I had these letters that this man had written from Pine Ridge, South Dakota, the Reds. And uh, I just read and read and read and read and reread these letters until I got the voice. And once I got that voice, it was the whole thing just opened right up because I could do research and learn more about, let's say, uh, uh, Cheyenne religion, whatever. And, uh, and it would take me about three months to percolate through my psyche so that I'd be able to to just use what I already had, which was the voice. I had it. And you know what I mean? You, when you've got that voice, you know you're, you're home. You know? And so then I was able to just work it through, work it through. Okay? But one of the problems I then discovered that I had was I had been writing fiction for four years. And I honestly did not know if I could go back to writing poetry. I had a feeling that writing fiction, you write from a different place inside yourself than writing poetry. It's a different place. And I didn't know if I could get back to that place. So I'm going to read you a poem from um, Rainstorm Over the Alphabet, which starts off with that idea or that problem. It's called Looking for Inspiration, and I go up into the um, mountains, trying to find whether I'm able to write any more poetry. Looking for inspiration. With Dada tantrums do I dose myself. 
self ellipsis liposuction, freeing all pronouns to float in the no intentions ether. I try therapists for my issues, the persistent delusion I have a soul. I try sleep deprivation, anything to subvert the empty page as metaphor. Climb red cliffs over a river, asking the muse if she has kissed me off forever. The stream sparkles, ripples pearl, the shallows rock loom. I crunch across gravel beds grown savage with gold brush. In tawny grass I hear dry metal ratcheting like locust wings, blade on carbon blade. A rattler lifts its diamond head, cocks its body in an S. Its scales glow as it shrives off last year's skin. Garnet beads twitch in divine telegraphy. It strikes blind, cowled. Fangs glint with clear epiphany. I can't kill everything that scares me. Perhaps I should change my technique. They say if you pierce your nipples with rings and yank, the rest of you will fall. Mm. I think I'm going to read some of the poems that I, I knew that Sandra was quoting a lot of me. So I'm going to read this poem called Ode for the Sleepless. And it's, you know, kind of a suburban poem. Ode for the Sleepless. A flock of geese cries so loud over checkered roofs it startles every light sleeper. Bathrobed, alone, yawning, we put kettles on, asking ourselves, why aren't the birds asleep on the ice, their heads tucked under wing? We're lost in midnight questions, as if the kitchens where we stand under Orion's sparkle never could be home. Yesterday was different. We walked under huge abstract skies talking about the gifted ones who do not love themselves. We imagined voices pulling them apart lung from lung until all that's left is the one who knows how far back this really goes, who hears a tangled heart that got that way long before it learned to speak, who feels life brimming at the eyes, who still believes, who keeps dawn safe so we can sleep, so we can dream that night birds signaling each other in the dark change what language can be. Somnambulous dawn. I wake to find myself blue and blanket wrapped like Chief Seattle, knee deep in snow on the Warren Lake spillway. First light spreads its fungus, my head steams, my heart bumps so hard I fall dizzy in wind whipped wondering what blizzard has blown me into this drift where sleet peppers my one good eye and a sky the color of my mother's 
iron hair demands to know why I have forsook the face she hammered into me. The wind says insomnia is spiritual. I get to my knees, raise my arms, addressing the blackboard clouds. It's not that I've sinned exactly, I say. I just have a different aesthetic. I never liked the old prayers and have dreamt all my life of making new ones. Let's see if I can find some other stuff. There are poems that uh, This is called On Blueberry Hill. Um, I guess it was 1953 when I first heard Fats Domino sing On Blueberry Hill. And it was a revelation. And this is a poem about first love. I dream my hedge is blown away by a Siberian wind come loping down through Canada. The lawn widowed, a voice says my name. I say, yes. Even before I open my eyes and find my lids are two pools of black water. Is it an angel or the lost boy asking, what first love is like. I show him the movie. She driving down a logging road in her mother's new convertible. Oaks arching over green shadows cast on moss rocks. He, a young man, lies back staring into branches laced like lovers' arms entwined. Radio saxophone breezes a boom shot above treetops showing the town miles away, church steeples, town hall, clock tower, shops where store clerks with purple bags under their eyes like sporting house blues piano players hitting five and dime. Cessnas sputter off screen, taxiing on the runway in sync with cicadas droning like comb and paper kazoos. What the movie is all about is the soundtrack. Her family in steerage from Ireland, his walking 300 miles from Laurentian farm valleys to Milltown factory jobs. What he gasps as he kneels between her thighs with the radio knob throbbing Fats Domino in his spine is how much he feels the music's throat-ripping strain his soul can count the anecdotal beat of in his blood, highballing through all the local stops, shabooming like a National Express. What the music bruises them with, bleeds pink like her chiffon Isadora Duncan's scarf. What he asks her is, what sense does virtue make if there's no redemption as great as this salt burn at the lips of hell? He, her kiss blushes his face. The wind stands still. Sunlight opens between his shoulder blades. What she whispers is, we'll be together in eternity as she drops the shift in reverse and backs them down to their betrayals. The smile he thought would always give him up, she gives to someone else. He doesn't marry her. He marries the one he can grow up and have children with. Yet his life turns into one held breath, a dream he wakes from one morning
to find black water standing in the wells of his eyes. We had a workshop this afternoon and one of the, one of the poets had a poem about that kind of regret, you know, that, that it didn't work. You know, you, always, you think, this is it, you know. Cynthia and I spent a good deal of time in Mexico. We spent two months in Mexico. And I started getting interested. In Mexican art, and of course you mentioned Mexican art, and it's Diego Rivera and uh, Frida Kahlo, his wife, sometimes they quarreled often and they got divorced and remarried and what have you. I'm looking for a, a, a poem, a particular poem about uh, this piece of art that we bought in a, a city called Oaxaca where there's a lot of beautiful carving that they do there and, uh, and I bought a uh, Jaguar's head, life-sized, that is covered in beads, tiny beads, with serpents and scorpions and rabbits and coyotes and peyote buttons on the nose and so on. Um, so this is called the uh, Huichol, which is a tribe in western Mexico, Huichol Jaguar's Head. And I brought it home and put it on the wall and sat there and just started writing off of it. Beads, one by one, in a matrix of warm beeswax. The ears like fletched rainbow palm fronds, the better to hear you with. The vaudeville proscenium of its mouth. Its winking smile like a red Diablo strangling a bug-eyed taxista. The arc of animals, two by two. The curling antennae of its spectral dragonflies. The yellow radiance of their navels. The white wings of its eye teeth. The gaslights of its lower jaw. The rabbits with black eyes like salivary glands. The red brick road of its tongue stippled with poppies. The open prayer of its sunset throat filled with cricket song and castanets. The drunk with mescal skin snoring under the roof of its mouth. The golden jaw like the body armor of your mother's sorrow the orange spreading nova of its nostrils, the black hexagons of its cathode eyes, the better to see you with, the twin scorpions of its forebrain, stingers poised like the final cue, the galaxy of its skull, spiral serpents hissing, the jaguar's head, its bilateral symmetry, the peyote button of its chin, the beautiful kitty. <laughs> it's a poem about, uh, about Frida. She died in 1954. And um, after a life of suffering, you wouldn't believe. And um, her wish to be cremated was, was carried out. And so this is called Frida's Cremation. After Siqueiros, Cardenas, and Rivera guard her remains and the red flag on her coffin, after the slow cortege through the city, 
after pallbearers place her on the conveyor belt, after the funeral director ignites the gas jets, after they leap to life like banked rows of blue shark's teeth gnashing, after the mortician throws the switch, Frida begins to sail head first through the door of fire. A scorching wind roars out to singe Diego's face. Her sister Christina rushes to snatch the fingers off Frida's, uh, the rings off Frida's fingers. Diego's eyes dry out from staring. A pulse of silver light rushes through him. It's Frida's hair blazing. He remembers the last entry in her diary. Feet? What need have I of feet when I have wings to fly? Diego pulls a pencil from his vest pocket, sketches her skeleton in his address book. Her smile turns to ash. Even her bones are beautiful. They loved each other desperately. Some people who love each other desperately just can't get along. It's sad. And I'm, I'm feeling like, gosh, I'm bringing only sad poems. I better change the tone. You remember Tiny Tim? Does anybody remember Tiny Tim from TV? And he had a girlfriend that he married on the Ed Sullivan show. Does anybody remember her? She, her name was Miss Vicky. <laughs> Miss Vicky and Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim was this guy with wild hair. He always wore a suit that didn't fit, fit and a big fat tie and, you know what I mean, floppy shoes. And, and he played the ukulele on Ed Sullivan. <coughs> and everybody thought he was a genius. Tiny Tim, as I remember him, and that's the whole thing. It's this button as close as I get to rap. <laughs> Tiny Tim as I remember him. <clears throat> Tiny Tim waddles to center stage the Harpo marks of pre-war 60s with angel ringlets and cheap ukulele and big snozzola who paid no payola singing lays of gentler days in terza rima, karma do. His spindly legs are flying things with pointy wings that barely bound along the ground. Dip do, drew to do lips with chew when Ed Sullivan was God. Nothing changed. Always the same goofy acts rearranged. Chinese jugglers spinning plates with sticks and talking dogs, delivering comic monologues as others took to the streets wearing white sheets or sarongs with bongs, blowing smoke up Miss Vicky as others died in Mississippi to pay everyone's dues to Mr. Blues while Bob Dylan, heir to Walt Whitman, waited in the wings, tuning his strings. Yeah. And let's see. Here's here's another one that's kind of kind of chanting. Uh, it's called the Undead and it's dedicated to George Rivera. No. Was a director of a movie called *The Night of the Living Dead*. I don't know if any of you would uh, stay up that late, <laughs> but uh, I was thinking about something that James Baldwin had said in the novel. He said that um, that the that the difficulty of, uh, that those of us who want to live uh, passionately is that there are so many dead people walking the streets around us. So I kind of took that idea. The undead. We are the undead, the shoot em in the head dead, our tombstone faces smeared with mire. Ho he ho, we intone as we groan to work on the freeway like 
a chorus of feathered tank team wrestlers in sequined hard hats getting ready to rumble to make the world safe for the vitally challenged. Disturbing signs have appeared in the western sky, rumors of women teaching their children to fly, teenagers playing their loud whatever music in our airspace. No one has to order us to leave our graves and stumble like an army of blind witch wanders toward those of you living in those ranch houses on the edge of town. We don't know why you're so afraid of us. We pay our taxes. We just have this urge to surge into your dens and channel surf on the cable mummy network for our favorite shows, mausoleums of the rich and famous, interesting test patterns, the home funeral hour. Here's another teenage adolescent poem. It's called Joanne. Joanne passed away. Joanne, we were at that age when all you know is what you don't want. Before the drunken midnight phone calls. We hung out at the uptown diner. She jammed quarters into the lit jukebox's right lung and punched numbers. Little Richard banging long tall Sally before he got religion. The music rocked us like orphans. As her music logic shifted, don't be cruel after in the still of the night. As shoppers bent through sleep, throat toward Christmas, words zagged through her cigarette lips. She'd start in about her boyfriend, her eyes like, her eyes like blown out umbrellas. She'd grip the jukebox's shoulders as if to shake out a song that would make a difference to a guy whose father treated him like a human sacrifice, waiting for a bad holiday. I got a cowboy boy. Looks just like a stick of macaroni. <laughs> they say that DJs invented the art of stringing cuts together. It wasn't them. It was Joanne. Looking at me with her earth angel eyes. You're a man, she said. You can leave. No, I couldn't. It's kind of a jazz poem. I don't know how I'm doing on time. I'm not doing all right. When I have a minute or two left. It's called Notes on Grace, and it's about the difficult thing of, of going to Kansas City. Charlie Parker's in here. Driving back east through cornfields, cornfields under fluorescent skies, stalks with outreaching palms receiving light, turning it to life, what they are, how they're formed perfectly together. The highway loops up ramps and suddenly towers in rows, red brick, marble white, with mile-long freight trains slow rolling through stockyards, stockyards, steam, smoke, rising, making haze. Come with me if you want to go to Kansas City. I find myself singing out the car window to Charlie Parker's ghost, feeling him reach inside the fibers of song to leap Oxygen scales with night's blue statement. So long, pretty baby, the time has come for me to bid adieu. And the promised poetry of the road becomes a sky filled with neon. Put a $20 gold piece on my watch chain. Don't cry over me, because I'm going to Kansas City an effortless movement of alto air, corn leaves 
uplifting and a rain filled and look at my table of contents. <laughs> that will help. <coughs> Let's see. This poem is kind of dedicated to an old lady that lived in our neighborhood she was widely reputed to be a witch. And I think once she did have a kind of power, and so I, I hope you'll see that in the poem, that she's, she's actually got power. Um, here's how it goes. Cabbage Night. Old Lady Gardino jumped up from her rocker at the thump on her porch. It was the night before Halloween. The neighborhood kids whined till their parents let them run loose in a pack. They swarmed the garden fences. Nick, knack break the witch's back, they chanted. She was marked with the twisted right foot, the sign of the goat. Her high-laced boot, pure lead. She was the palsy in your grandfather's hands the pink slip in your father's pay envelope. Into the rows they spilled through dry corn stalks like a starveling drill corps standing at attention to a white full moon. They tore out the cabbages, running through the empty Hubbard squash vines, through the walkway between the farmhouse house and old lady Gardino's. They lofted the cabbages over her banister, weaving like Apaches in a figure eight, crying, human heads, human heads. She ran out, pouring a basin of scalding water over the railing. Ghosts of steam sprang up from wet angles. Steps, the hood of a Ford parted, parked in the alley. You're all in my power, she cried. Go, bring me more cabbage hearts, fly. The kids stopped in their tracks. Should they do as a witch had commanded? First one child, then the whole gang broke into a walk toward their three decas. I hope a little Boston accent got in there, three decades. Right? A chill crackled into the air, shooing them along. Hot cider, if they were lucky, if they were lucky. No screeching dragon clawing their hair as they tried to run. Feet stuck in sidewalks soft as fresh bread. Old Lady Gardino stepped back out on her piazza gathering cabbages into her apron. Good soup, she said to herself, the last words before dawn. So it did kind of make a kind of sense. I used to think that we were horrible and cruel, but I didn't realize it was a kind of contract, you know, between us. I don't know, maybe I'll read you one more poem called Creation. I was trying to figure out what it would be like. See, this is a book of poems about a guy who's, who's uh, quit his, in, his factory job uh, to stay in his apartment, uh, in his tenement, 
and try to paint. And I really had no idea, you know. I had to imagine myself into that place where, you know, you could be a painter. So this is called creation. In school, the nuns taught God made the heavens and earth in six days. Duhamel never believed it. He saw his mother and father make it in one day. At first, like in the book, it was dark. His mother lifted the curtain and made light shine through the glass windows and the wooden crossbars making their children the shadows. His mother carried him and created the kitchen, the bathroom, talcum, pleasure. She made the air the smell of hot toast. His father walked him with both hands and created doors and the world outside. Angel clouds and telephone wires strung above streets were how things are connected. He created motion in a maroon packard and colors for go, stop, and maybe. They created smokestacks, steeples, and silos to mark the different kinds of work. They created Revere Beach. And for everything without end, the Atlantic, with waves rushing toward them saying, reverse, everything in reverse. Darkness came, light in reverse. Shouting came, laughter in reverse. Duhamel invented more uses for darkness, the pleasures of making the world over again. Bathrobe sky, melted tar night, packard wind. He hummed as his eyes opened in reverse. This is like growing up in, you know, like Lowell, Massachusetts, you know, where Carraway came from. Mill towns and all that, you know. I'm sure people from Georgia just have this complete uh, uh, sense that what I'm about to read you is, is exactly correct about the Northeast. This is called Unwritten Laws. The book is subtitled Ideas of Order, which is a steal from Wallace Stevens. We wrote a poem called uh, Ideas of Order in Little, I'm sorry, in Key West. It's called Unwritten Laws. You couldn't climb into Bernardino's garden and just take vegetables. He'd throw a brick at you with his mighty Joe Young chest muscles from hauling lead in a wheelbarrow between surprised looking ripped out fire hydrants in the water supply company's back lot and the white hot crucible, the plugs holding their twisted shapes a minute before, slipping like glacier walls into a silver sea to be poured off again into molds. When he came home after work to to tend his tomatoes, neatly staked and tied with thin strips of white cloth, he would know, or some enemy you didn't know you had might tell on you because the least you do to mine, you do to me. And it went both ways. Then you'd get it. You had to mind the priests. If you had diabetes so bad the Boston doctors said having another baby would kill you, you still had to because God wants new souls. You couldn't walk on the Fawn's front lawn because Sarge slept under the porch in crisscrossed shadows. Sarge's dog. You couldn't walk on the Fawn's front lawn because Sarge slept slept under the porch in crisscross shadows. His slobbery lower jaw sputtered as he snored off his last bucket of beer. If you shook his ground, his canine training would wake him. Everyone knew Sarge could bite through chains and put gouges in your, in your thigh that turned purple and then yellow. 
He couldn't even think of paying old Lady Gardino to poison his chow. He was a war hero. He bit the butt of the Generalissimo. On Memorial Days, Lyle Fawn would leash him and march behind the Circle Canadian Drum and Bugle Corps with a doughboy helmet buckled on, onto his head at a jaunty angle with a cracked, dirt brown leather chin strap. You couldn't play with yourself or you'd get like Shaky Joe, spastic on the railroad tracks, and what he did with his fly unbuttoned was awful red. You couldn't swear within earshot of a dragonfly or it would sew your lips up. That's why its real name was Flying Needle. You had to mind the nuns or they'd put you in the encyclopedia. You couldn't go to the Central Avenue Spar. Its show windows hadn't changed since the owners went to New York City to celebrate Truman's miracle come from behind victory over Dewey and saw stores on 42nd Street with cheap telescopes lying tilted up at fading stars warped on blue corrugated night sky. Its door, the gateway to inside, whoosh, a big electric fan, a middle-aged man with a mustache waiting for the counterman to stop serving two high school girls cherry flips like he was asking them for a big favor. Zipping panics at the window for cops who knew he would sell anything from behind the glass showcases with their buck knives and marine band harmonicas. A row of red plastic tuffets along the counter and beyond two sets of booths where a rainbow mafia jukebox gloomed the studs of leather jackets humped over hamburgs from the, the grill black as a pagan altar. Floorboards showing through the cratered tiles that checkerboarded into darkness under the broken exit sign and on out into God only knew what blind alley where you would stagger some midnight because you were only human in the hot, beery stench of Dragon's Cafe, lost, bricked in, melting, begging for another chance, looking up at a narrow strip of stars in the shape of a big capital I. I mean, I come from a generation old enough, you know, I mean, sort of second generation from Canada, you know. And uh, they just did not trust the banks. You know, they would buy a house I and mean, they would pool their money for a decade if they had to and then they would buy a house and then they would pool their, their money again and they would buy another house and that way sooner or later even the cousins got a house okay and so one of the one of the ideas of order that you grew up with was that, uh, that you had to be loyal to your clan and, um, and that meant that having an ego was a sin. You know, that's kind of the big capital lie that I'm talking about, is having, having an ego or a sense of your, your own self. Well, I mean, I've just got a million things I want to share with you. I think what I'm going to do is wrap it up. Um, I'm going to read you another poem that um, Sandra referenced in her intro. It's called The Music While the Music Lasts. It's a steal from uh, T.S. Eliot, Four Quartets. The line he wrote was, um, you are the music while the music lasts. I think it's going to be East Coker, something like that. I think it's East Coker. Anyway, so this is a story about being 17 years old, a freshman at Columbia University, and uh, wearing my my letter jacket from football and going down to Greenwich Village, you know, being cool, <laughs> digging the jazz and what have you, you know. <laughs> The music while the music lasts. Seventeen 
wandering drunk in the Greenwich Village strip joint, gaga at this boa constrictor, worming its way into a nearly naked woman's g-string. A b-girl grabbed my ass. <laughs> couldn't say it. I thought, it I, I thought it was me, you know. The girl couldn't help herself. <laughs> so later, <laughs> when, I, when I fell by the, van, the, the village vanguard, this trumpet player was slow bluesing it like bebop. Then he was saying minimally bebop. And then cording up, bebop, and then down, bebop, with this sad, albeit gold horn. I snap my fingers at the bar. Two black guys like NFL tackles glared at me to stop popping. Miles, the MC shouted, making a come come applause gesture. This was 1958. Yesterday, Charlie Parker was dead. Even later, when I started to listen, I heard Miles was in his kind of blue period, as if it were not joy, but Bird's horror of silence that made him fill each bar with 30-second notes. This was somehow why the great soul of night was gone, leaving a hole the size of Kansas City in miles. He was telling the story of how Charlie one night at Birdland when people were clinking, chattering, he lost it. Jumped off the banner stand, put his fist through glass for a fire axe, waiting like Samson with the jawbone of an ass into the Philistines, that they would use him that way as background for their deals. Creating a new connotation for the word axe, as in, did you bring your? Only later did I begin to dream poems could be like that. New connotations spoken when we stagger, struck by the beautiful blunt instrument of the world. And then, finally, a poem that Sandra, we're talking about dreams this afternoon in the workshop, and it was altogether proper as we were in the house of dreams, uh, workshopping poems. And uh, as we were coming in, you know, we're talking about dream, dream poems, and and um, I did get to the point where I had the discipline to actually wake myself out of a dream if it was good, you know. Uh, but it was like swimming up through fathoms of water, you know, and holding my breath, and then finally breaking loose, and then breaking loose meant waking up, and then and then putting the light on, and then getting to the notebook and the, and the, and the ballpoint and, and writing it out. You know, I, I had uh, this dream where my oldest son Bill was uh, uh, running away from me across a a long, huge lawn. And he, disappeared behind this old oak tree and I came around and, and he was there uh, in the in the roots of the tree and uh, and kind of just coming out of what I conceived to be a, an epileptic fit and uh, he opened his eyes and, and they were they had been kind of rolled up white and then he looked at me and he said daddy eternity has glass eyes and when I dreamed that I just said you know, and I just swam up out of the beta, whatever. And ever since I've been able to do that, you know, wake up from a, a dream and write. So this is called Church Dream. I told my brother there was a poet so drunk, another man had to turn his pages. He said, let's go inside. We dipped a knee on the center aisle. I hadn't forgotten the invisible line between me and the sanctum sanctorum. 
the priest rang the chalice, maidens danced. A St. Francis statue with a dove on its fingertip turned and winked at me, nodding toward the incense and silky legs spiraling up the nave. It's all right, he said. You just have spiritual stage fright. My, my chest was packed like a nation in there. I told my brother, I walked out on all this, the sheep, the goats, the wheat, the chaff. I know, he said, you made your desk your altar. And with that, I'll, I'll leave it. Sandy's asking me if I would stand still for some questions. And I will, but I, I don't see how you could possibly have a question, as everything I write is so absolutely clear. <laughs> are, are you getting what I'm doing? I mean, it's music is what I'm doing. Okay, I mean, if I had a tenor sax, that would be, you know, I mean, it's what I'm, that's what I'm doing, is doing music. You know, almost to the point where I don't even care uh, about anything else. You know, just want to get those those gnarly consonants making sparks rubbing up against each other. You know, I like flinty sounds. You know, I like corrugation and texture. That's what I love. I love that density, density of experience. Well thought of. I'm answering a question you didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about the poetry slam? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I love the performance aspect of it because I'm a, you know, I, I'm a performance poet too. You know, um, I read at a at a slam at uh, Avogadro's number in Fort Collins. And uh, of course, with a thing like that, you're mostly listening. I mean, right, you get up, you get up there for maybe uh, five minutes and, you know, do a thing and then you gotta get off, you know. Um, and I guess the feeling I had was that there were some really great performers, you know. There was a group called the Mystic D. Um, that, you know, just did poetry in unison, and they were right on. I mean, wonderful kind of incantatory uh, performance style. But, you know, the language, the language was thin. It, it, it didn't have that kind of density that I wanted. And, and, and that's when I began to think about the density and the experimental courage you get in writing programs you know, in the universities. And then there's this other thing which is much more popular and much less difficult and uh, very entertaining. And so being me, I just sort of look at both of them and I think, I wonder if it'll ever, you know, there'll ever be a synthesis where, where the performance poetry or the slam poetry gets better, you know, or the sort of, uh, Ivory Tower poets come down, you know, to street level and, uh, and open up and uh, stop worrying about being inaccessible. That is to say, they are worried if they are not inaccessible, you know. I mean, M.L. Liebler, who teaches at Wayne State, uh, he says to me, you know, sounding like Rodney Dangerfield, you know, I can't get no respect. I read in front of my colleagues in the English department and, and, and they just walk out and then I say, well, what, what happened? And they said, well, we can understand you. <laughs> you know? It's like it's got to be a total puzzle or else <clears throat> who would pat you on the back once you wrote your explication and, and published it in the MLA? 
You know what I mean? It's, it's this professional thing. It's kind of career thing. And I don't know. I mean, it, it continues to be um, a, uh, a thing that I, that I watch because uh, obviously I love the movies. I love jazz. I love pop music. You know? Uh, and um, I'm always looking for those wonderful moments when something that's kind of a street phenomenon turns into something that, you know, or vice versa. I mean, there's a wonderful, wonderful book called, it, the, uh, it's called Air Guitar, and I can't remember the name of the author, but it's a book about art criticism, and he says an art critic is like an air guitarist, you know? <laughs> he doesn't do it, but he, he makes it pretty good, you know? And, uh, and he's, he said that uh, when about, 19, I don't know, the late 60s, early 70s, um, he had a, an art gallery in New York City that he was running. And uh, a friend of his who taught up at Columbia uh, brought him up into uh, Harlem. He said, you got to see this. And what it was, was it was... Um, Dancing, you know, what, what, gosh, what's the word for that? Something dancing. You know, where guys spin on their heads. Break dancing, dance, break dancing, you know. And he said, well, I started going up there every week. And what, I, and what happened was that every week that went by, I saw the, the, that kind of dancing changing. And in fact, he said, I saw uh, that they, that's, these kids were um, stealing dance moves from ballet. You know, I mean, they'd kind of sneak into the Kennedy Center and and watch ballet and then take it back out in the streets. You know, because they they were in competition. They wanted to uh, they wanted to be the best. You know, so they went to ballet. So, you know what I'm saying? They, they were out in the streets and they were doing, you know, kind of robotic moves and what have you, but, they, but they, they were also learning from the ballet, you know. I love it when that kind of thing happens in America, you know. And I don't know where else it's likely to happen, you know, because we're so crazy and elect, elect, e eclectic, electric too. Um, other questions? You Yeah. Um, this is this is going to be a real this is a really cliche question. Oh great, thanks. Sorry, um, <laughs> but uh, I mean just I mean it's you know people who are interested in you know writing and poetry like myself and I know other people in here. Um, you know we're busy hopefully absorbing a lot of other people like yourself and mm -hmm. you know other established poets. Um, but when you were you know fledglings like us, what who who did you look to the most? Um, and just, you know, read and just kind of say, you know, if I could just figure that out, mm -hmm. you know, who, who were a few of those people and why? The, the biggest uh, influences on me, the, the love, was with Walt Whitman. Absolutely. Not only just in the things that he said in the poems, but the things that he said in prose, you know, he said something that was pretty interesting to me. He says, folks expect the poet to show them the path between the world and their souls. That really lit me up. I would like to blaze that trail. I would like to be able to do that, you know. Granted, there is a soul, you know. <laughs> Becoming more and more problematical as children of John Locke, you understand? <laughs> I'm referencing a, a line in one of his poems. <laughs> it talks about John Locke. And, um, British empiricism. Anything else? Um, yeah. I've heard about this 
book the other day talks about various male artists, say, you know, writers, painters, mm -hmm. singers, whatever, and about um, their muses, say, Man Ray and Dee Miller and John and Yoko. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, do you have a muse? Does she inspire you? Or, and if not, what do you think about this whole idea of muses and inspiration in these post confessional lyric times? Mm -hmm. exist. All he said was, I would just prefer to concentrate on recognizing ideal forms as they occasionally get embodied in life, in the world around us, instead of regarding them as inhabitants of some cosmic warehouse, you know, light years away. So I do, I believe in the doctrine of imminence. The sense that, that, you know, it's right there. It's right there. Uh, maybe I can read you another poem called My Uncle Pete. My mother gave him his nickname, English for Pauv Pitu. Uh, little pitiful one, Pauv Pitu. When he fell in a trash barrel of fire, a schoolboy I thought, Icarus, too close to the sun. When he showed me his web of scars like a beaten silver breastplate, how much he could have taught me, I think, remembering his land camera, the red glow of his dark room. I could have become a photographer, taking shots all over my own town. My first big coup, a thousand suns sitting in a thousand factory windows. Then, spangled sunflecks on leaf tips by the river, banks of votary candles flickering in St. Mary's. I see myself asked by interviewers to explain my first gallery show, like my Uncle Pete who lost the power of speech from the shock of his burns. I would struggle to say, I don't really believe in the sublime, but you know, the photos keep telling me different. that it is there. But, you know, it's romanticism, too, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know. It is, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a belief, it's a belief system that you can find meaning, as opposed to the postmodernist who says that any statement of meaning is a fascistic act because it imposes itself on other people. Um, I guess I'm just crude because I, I don't find that a problem. I think, in fact, that uh, hmm. 
I said to Robert Bly once, I said, you know, Robert, when I first saw you reading back in 67, your readings were like two hours long and there was like 85% poems and about 15% rap. And now it's 85% rap and 15% poems. And he looked at me and he, and he said, people want answers, Bill. You know, down his nose with that Norwegian Minnesota thing he has, you know. People want answers, Bill. <laughs> But it's your job not to, you know. <laughs> other other questions? Uh, you know, I just, uh, yeah, oh, great. Uh, I was wondering, jazz has inspired so many uh, poets, mm -hmm. uh, poets and beats. What do you think it is specifically? Is it improvisation? Or yes. Is it that mainly? Or? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it isn't only, it isn't only that. Yeah. It isn't only that. It is um, the manifestation through a, through a horn or the voice of soul. You know, I mean that's a cliche. You know, got soul. You know, but that's part of it. That's part of it. Absolutely. You know, because think about it. You know, you get up in front of people. And uh, every night you're blowing T for two different, you know, every night. And you got to be there every single night because tonight by, might be the night that, uh, that Dizzy does T for two in a way that is entirely different from any other time he did it. And, and you gotta, you got to hear that. The sense of people being out on that edge of, of daring to, to try to say something that is, uh, that has life in it, you know, that isn't, that isn't just thinking about life, you know, which a lot of intellectualized poetry is thinking about life. And, and some of it is extremely smart. You know, you admire the people that are just really brainy, you know. But that isn't what I'm after. I'm after getting life itself in the work. You know, and that's, that's, well, you could think it's ridiculous to even try. Because it's impossible. You can't, you know, it's, I mean, it's words. Words are just indicators and they don't refer to anything, you know, so therefore, I mean, but, but themselves, you know. It's like you're walking across a creek and you see some stones in the creek and you look down and you say, there are stones in this creek. And then you think, the words I have just said are not the stones in the creek. They are a grouping of concepts about the stones in the creek. You know, and it's not about, you can't get the stones, and yet, that's why I say the word romantic, because, because I think it is romantic to try and not be so sophisticated and cool and, and stand around at cocktail, cocktail parties and, and say, oh, aren't you naive? You know, which is a sort of a postmodernist way, you know. Well, you don't agree with me, you're naive. You know, and I say, yeah, okay, cool. I'm naive, whatever, you know. But I, I believe it's possible to, that I, well, I know I believe it's necessary for me to try to get, to get life in the work, you know? And it's, uh, remember I mentioned this book, Air Guitar? This guy does a chapter on uh, a, uh, a guy named Chet Baker, who was a trumpet player and a singer. And he said, it was an interesting thing, he said, 
Chet Baker never got his due because the because the jazz critics and the teachers of jazz music in places like like Juilliard they could never they could never analyze it. You know, they could listen to Sonny Stitt on the on the, you know tenor, and they could say, well, yeah, uh, he does a kind of growling vibrato right here, you know, vibrato right here, and and well, let's make a category out of that. How to teach my students to do the growling vibrato? You know what I mean? And so, but the thing was that 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 Chet just sang the song. <laughs> and, you know what I'm saying? And, and it was like, there's no mystique about that. He just sang the song. Yeah, like a very plain delivery too. Like, like, well, yeah, but he had this real tender voice, you know? Real tender voice, and he would, he would just sell you that song, and uh, and there wasn't anything flashy or technical about it. And so, people who want to teach technique and who put technique at the center of their identity as teachers, you know, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. These are the techniques. You learn them, you'll be hip. You know, uh, they don't know what to do with it. You know, at best they say, inimitable. <laughs> One of a kind, inimitable. Can't teach him. It's just a talent. You know, can't can't abstract anything teachable about him. You know, and uh, he was. I think that the I can't think of the author's name, but he was brilliant in that chapter. Just great, great. Talking also about in another chapter about. Uh, Waylon Jennings, it's fantastic. And Waylon, Waylon was talking about doing a an in, a, a, a huge con, uh, concert in Atlanta uh, to like twenty five thousand people. And this guy's interviewing him. He says, uh, "How do you feel about that?" And he said, "Well, these are not my people." People I know are living in small towns, and, and when I go play for them, I play in roadhouses, and it's dangerous because they'll throw bottles after you if they don't like what you're doing, you know. And they got the guts to, to tell you, you know, they think you're going down a wrong road with your music. Now you may stick to it, but but at least they told you. Whereas I feel like the 25,000 people in Atlanta, they're just worshippers. I'm not going to learn a thing from them. I'd rather be challenged on my own turf by people that I knew and grew up with and respect for various reasons, you know. And, and I think basically what you're saying is that, that going through those kinds of tests uh, helped him grow as a human being and as an artist, you know, both. So, well, other, other thoughts, uh, questions? Uh, I think it's time we head it out into the great American night. <laughs> we have books for sale and we'll be happy to I will be ecstatic. <laughs> <laughs>